Liz, I'm wondering if you think Donald Trump can win New York. What do you think? I'm not sure, Maria, but he certainly won the hearts of New York last night. Yeah. Uh, this was a historic event. And look, people kept ignoring the obvious uh, quest here. It's not about Trump winning the popular vote in New York. It's about Trump helping uh, other candidates like Mike Lawler, who's mm. running to, for re-election uh, in New York State, win their seats because that was the balance of power in the House of Representatives. It's incredibly important that we keep the two or three House seats that flipped in 2022. Yeah. This meeting, uh, this gathering at Madison Square Garden certainly will help that uh, ambition. Yeah, and I was talking with Tommy Tuberville yesterday. Uh, Senator Tuberville Scott, and he was pretty firm in expectations that the Republicans take the Senate. Not so sure about the House, to uh, Liz's point. Yeah, it's questionable, Maria. And, and Liz is right. I mean, these uh, turnouts that we saw last night could really certainly help push that forward. And I'll just tell you, the way Trump kind of came off yesterday was, I think, really appropriate for the kind of situation that we're in coming into eight days away. And so he's calm, he's confident, and he's optimistic. And that's kind of what I believe the folks kind of that are following him so closely want to see right now. Because as we go into the last few days here, seeing that his optimism is there and the fact that, that people are showing up shows you that there's actually a fervor going on right now, right when we need it yeah. to fulfill this goal. Yeah, it's probably good to be peaking now yep. when he is. Um, real quick, Scotty, on this market, Dow Industrial is up 200 points. Is this about Trump? Is this about big tech earnings? Is this about the economic data that's coming this week? What do you think? Everything. But I think right now, Maria, Everything. it's obviously Trump's uh, push in the polls, but certainly the earnings ahead have been so good for the market when you look yeah. at tech earnings in the past few quarters. So they're carrying that through. If you look at the NASDAQ, too, the biggest index okay. up this morning, carrying it up. Exactly, with ahead of the big tech earnings. All right, we will be right back and we'll take a closer look. That was Gatestone Institute senior fellow. He's the author of Plan Red, China's Project to Destroy America. Gordon Chang, back with me. Gordon, unbelievable breach here. Once again, election interference, if this is true. What do you make of it? Well, certainly the Chinese are more effective at this and more determined than our authorities think. Um, you know, they went after Verizon, AT&T, all the major carriers. They penetrated both campaigns and as well as the FISA system. So, you know, the issue here is what are we going to do about it? Because these are our networks. We don't defend them like we should. Also, we don't impose costs on China for doing this. You know, China needs us really uh, at a great ex to a great extent right now because their economy. And, and we're not imposing those costs for China doing these things to us. This is our fault. This is our country. Why can't well, we do this? I think this is a great point, uh, Gordon. And, and this administration, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, has been so easy, soft on China. They allow China to roll over the United States from all the propaganda they send through to the hacking, to the fentanyl flowing into this country, intellectual property theft, uh, attacking uh, America on so many levels, undermining America. And there's no response whatsoever. So I'm not surprised that Chinese hackers get into to Donald Trump's phones and J.D. Vance's phones, and there's no response to that either. I mean, they, they didn't even respond to a, you know, a threat that they're going to kill Donald Trump from Iran until, you know, what, a week ago. Yes, you know, and when we look at the administration, you know, they are taking measures against China, but they're far too late. Then they look campaign related. So, yes, um, really, the administration has done all its best to try to accommodate China when China relentlessly attacks us. So there's a mismatch in perceptions here. We can all speculate why. But the point is, President Biden has not uh, uh, followed through on his most important constitutional duty, which is to protect us from foreign attack, because That's we right. are being attacked by China. And, and so is uh, Taiwan. I mean, a soft attack. Taiwan's defense ministry says that the Chinese military carried out another round of combat patrols, quote unquote, combat patrols near Taiwan yesterday. 22 Chinese warplanes and seven Chinese warships operating around Taiwan from Sunday to this morning. This happening a day after the Chinese government vowed to take countermeasures to defend its sovereignty following the U.S. approval of a $2 billion arms sale package to Taiwan. That package includes an advanced air defense missile system battle tested in Ukraine, Gordon. Can you believe this? China goes and does all this testing around Taiwan and then comes out with this idea that it's going to protect its sovereignty. What about Taiwan's sovereignty? Yes, and the Taiwan authorities believe that China will impose a quarantine within six months. 
A quarantine is not an act of war, but in these circumstances, it's going to lead to a blockade, which is an act of war. And certainly in the tense situation in East Asia, um, these exercises are pushing the uh, world to a war in East Asia, which, you know, when you look at the war in Ukraine, the one in the Middle East, and the insurgencies in North Africa that look like wars, this is World War III, unfortunately, and the Biden administration is not taking the measures that it, ha it has the power. It's not taking the measures necessary to ensure peace. Yeah. Well, so you think they're going to do a quarantine within six months around Taiwan? That's what the Taiwan authorities think, and I think that that's reasonable because yesterday's exercises were blockade practices, as were um, what the Joint Sword 24 20, uh, 2024B exercises on the 14th and 15th of this month. Wow. And of course, last Tuesday, you had those combat patrols, live fire exercises. Uh, this really is looking very, very worrisome. And what? we're not taking the measures to help Taiwan that are needed at this moment. That's unbelievable. I, you know, Gordon, I, I was not aware of that. That's pretty significant. Um, how would you justify a quarantine? I mean, is it a sickness? You say everyone's sick, there's a new disease out. I mean, what? How do you justify we're doing a quarantine for Taiwan? Well, China has no justification for a quarantine. And the United States should publicly tell the Chinese that the U.S. Navy and Air Force will help um, ships and planes get through a quarantine without inspection. Because if we don't do that, the Chinese will impose a blockade. And this will escalate into a war. So although the Biden administration thinks it can just sort of stay quiet, I don't think that that strategy has been working because we've seen these belligerent Chinese activities, not only against Taiwan, yeah. but also against the Philippines, Japan and India. That's unbelievable. Well, we certainly will follow that story and uh, watch for this potential quarantine that Taiwan expects and that you are also uh, tracking. Uh, Liz Peek, jump in here. Uh, Gordon, good morning. I presume the calculus changes uh, if Trump wins the election. And, you know, we hear an awful lot about Russia interfering in our election. Why don't we hear more about what China is doing? We hear vaguely that they're trying to interfere, but we know whose side they're on, Gordon. Why isn't that being more broadly publicized? Yeah, I think it's because the administration wants to focus on Russia and they don't right, want to definitely. talk about China. Re remember, Biden has staked his foreign policy success as saying, well, I've had good relations with China. Well, if he actually admits the truth, then he is basically saying his policy has failed. And so far, Liz, we have seen more interference from China than Russia in the 2024 election cycle. Right. With, and so, what, you know, let's have some pushback about that. I mean, and, and also identify that they are on the side of Kamala Harris, which I, I would imagine yeah. most voters really aren't aware of. Well, I mean, look, for, we've had what, Liz, 10 years of the Russia collusion line? I know, I know. You know, the Democrats, that's, what, that, that's their go to, right? Yeah. Russia, Russia, Russia. I mean, yeah. that, that's their go After they were able to get this crazy, fantastic story of Trump colluding with Russia through uh, and, and let it go viral across the world, they're going to keep going back to it. And, and it's just outrageous that, that, you know, the Biden administration doesn't come clean and say, stop the nonsense. That was a exactly. lie and it was made up. Scott, jump in. Well, here's the thing, Maria. I mean, what's the risk here, Gordon, to China's, say, policies with Taiwan and other countries out there if Trump does, does win? Because what have they been waiting for, say, for the last six months with all the political turmoil in the United States to actually do something big like you talked about? Is there a risk if Trump wins, say, in eight days that they blow the chance to get that done? Yeah, I think that the Chinese will back off um, because they don't want to deal with Trump. Um, you know, they may think that he's friendly, but Trump has the capability of hitting them hard, as he's done while he was president. So they don't want him anywhere near the Oval Office because they don't want to take the risk. And I think Xi Jinping has just personally afraid of Trump. And that goes back to that April 2017 yeah. encounter at Mar-a-Lago, where Trump just sort of put uh, Xi Jinping on the back foot. But they wasted that is time. the pattern for China relations during those four years of the yeah. Trump administration. No, we haven't even discussed these North Korean troops uh, and, and, and what their role is in, in these wars uh, in terms of working with Russia, Gordon. There's, there's that as well. Uh, but of course, China has been complicit there as well, backing Iran. And uh, this new axis of evil has been crystallized.
Gordon, it's great to see you. We'll keep a spotlight on all of that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Maria. Kamala Harris facing more mockery online after debuting what some are calling a new accent in Pennsylvania. Listen. Scripture reminds us weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The path may seem hard, the work may seem heavy, but joy cometh in the morning, and church morning is on its way. The vice president speaking to a church congregation yesterday, people online likening the inflection of her speech to that of a pastor. The New York Times reporting Harris was working to bring themes of equity into her work as vice president, which includes directing her team to scour years of intelligence to find if briefing reports had any evidence of bias against women. There was none, but she continued focus on demographics for other domestic issues like vaccination metrics during the pandemic. A former aide saying, quote, she was always interested in race and gender, and we all knew it was really important to her, so we would proactively add that to her briefings. She didn't have to ask for it. And I guess that's the reason government is so inefficient these days. Maria, back to you. That is weird to hear her use a different accent. Yeah. Jerry. A bad one. It's, she sounds like a preacher. But yeah, also she appeared does. slightly uncomfortable, I thought. Yeah, was that rehearsed? I mean, did she actually go through that accent b backstage or with some uh, allies or, you know, some operatives before then? And they said, hey, you know what? Sounds great. Throw it out there. <laughs> go with it. I mean, no, what kind of I advice think, is that? I, I mean, you know, I walk away from it thinking, well, who is she? Yeah. I mean, I think people are unnerved because we don't really know if it's real or if it's fake. And people want authenticity. They want to know that they're speaking to someone who they know who they are. Yeah. Liz, this is not the first time we've heard different languages. Let's take a listen of other times. We were also questioning, what the heck is this accent? Watch this. You all helped us win in 2020, and we're going to do it again in 2024. You may not be a union member. You better thank a union member. For the five-day work week, you better thank a union member for sick leave. You better thank a union member for paid leave. Oh, boy, political season, man. Uh, Liz, your reaction? <laughs> well, look, I think you said it best, Maria. The word is authenticity. And when yeah. did we last hear that word? In 2016, when voters decided that Hillary Clinton was not who she was pretending to be. Kamala Harris is even worse because she has denied all of her past, basically, uh, including all of her past progressive far-left policies. So, you know, I think people really are scratching their heads and saying, will the Will the real Kamala Harris please stand up? Because so yeah. far, she has not. Yeah. All right. Well, Jerry, thank you for that. Uh, Jerry welcome. Willis, let's get a look at Peak, your reaction. Well, I thought it was an extraordinary event, Maria, not just in terms of the crowd size, because, by the way, there are also hundreds, if not thousands, of people outside the arena who couldn't get in. Yeah. So it really was an extraordinary thing. And having the Democrats deride this uh, event as a Hitler-like event really was so incredibly stupid after so many Democratic presidents have actually announced and accepted their nomination in Madison Square Garden. And by the way, banners, uh, flags of Israel were flying in this event. There were a lot of Hasidic Jews who showed up. So, I mean, I, I, the, the reporting, I did flip back and forth to see what the, uh, the liberal TV stations were showing about this. Of course, it was all negative. It was all about racism and so forth. But you know what? Uh, it was a great moment. And I think people watching it on Fox News last night, which they could do throughout, came away thinking this is the party of inclusion. By the way, this morning, the Daily Beast has our, an uh, article out saying that Melania Trump could be Donald Trump's secret weapon to winning this election. So there you go. Yeah, you know what? I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the Jewish angle because that was my uh, instinct as well, Liz. When I was watching yesterday on Fox News, 
um, Carly Shimkins was outside and she was interviewing everybody. And what struck me, Scott, was the fact that there were so many people holding Israeli flags. Yeah. And you know, what happened here in the last six, six months, I think, is while immigration and inflation are still our leading issues in terms of what voters are really impacted by, there has been another group of voters that have become one issue voters, and that is. Jewish voters, people who care about the treatment of Israel so much, and they feel that a red line was crossed with this administration. <laughs> that once Kamala Harris and Joe Biden threatened Israel that they're going to hold back weapons, that's it. That was the red line. And these voters are all in on Trump now Absolutely. because they recognize Israel will be better off with Trump as opposed to Kamala. And Biden blew it with those voters, Maria, and they're showing up for Trump. And I did yeah. Liz mentioned the, the moments that were there. I mean, talk about the moments. How many moments? Moments. There were just so many people there, and the, in, the rally was so long too. And folks stayed throughout and stayed around afterwards. So you had a total buy-in of the folks that were there, the folks that came from across the country to come back and see him. After, don't forget, guys, when we had the, the New York criminal trial, there wasn't a ton of support outside the courthouse when he was going through that. Nowadays, we've got a ton of support rallying around him from all over the country coming to New York to see this event. Yeah, and, and I'm glad Liz mentioned, you know, what uh, what happened at Madison Square Garden in the past. People have accepted their nominations there. Yeah. But the fact that the Democrats are comparing this to Nazism, Liz, is so disgusting. You actually have people speaking out about it, like Mayor Adams was yeah. very disturbed by it. He said it's ridiculous to, to compare Trump to, to Hitler. And then you had actual survivors of the Holocaust. I saw one guy on Instagram. He was horrified by it. And he said that Kamala Harris owes President Trump an apology. Yeah. For comparing him to Hitler for this MSG, they're so. I mean, obviously, they must be just so jealous that he commanded the entire Madison Square Garden. I think they're, they're just. You know, I think terrible. they're scared to death, Maria. Whatever they're doing isn't working. In fact, yeah. uh, according to Politico, the main pack supporting Kamala Harris uh, came out yesterday with an advisory saying, "Hey, this Hitler stuff, this demonization of Donald Trump, and by the way, half the country is not working. We need to go back to." Politics. Policies and talking about what Kamala Harris will do or will do or won't to do or say she the won't country. Do. Won't exactly. tell you what she won't do or will do. Either. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. We don't know what she's going to do. Right. Okay. She won't answer the question. I, I can't believe how many times she has been unable to answer the question of how will you rein in inflation. Yeah. I mean, that should be easy for her. Well, well, how, how do you vote for somebody you don't know who you're getting? Yeah. You know, Trump is for Trump is Trump, right? That's fine. But you know what you're getting. Kamala, right. you have no idea what you're going to get. So no. that's a crapshoot. It's a lot, a lot of uh, flip-flops going on. All right, we're just getting started this hour. Quick break. Time now for the word on Wall Street. Top investors watching your money. Joining me right now to talk more about stocks is Morgan Stanley Managing Director and Private Wealth Advisor, Kathy Entwistle. Also with us this morning is Scott Martin. Uh, Kathy, good to see you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Uh, and Scott, I want to get your take on markets this morning. Take a look at this rally underway as we kick off a major trading week, the last trading week of October. The Dow Industrial is up 190. Right now, the NASDAQ up 137. Third quarter earnings underway. Technology is now on deck. This week's going to be a big one. We got Alphabet coming out tomorrow, Microsoft, Meta on Thursday, Apple and Amazon on Thursday, uh, Meta on Wednesday, rather. We will also hear from Ford Motor tonight after the bell, followed by McDonald's tomorrow, Caterpillar on Wednesday, and Chevron and Exxon Mobil on Friday. I guess, Scotty, I want to get your take first on big tech because these names have had huge moves in their stock prices, and now it's sort of judgment day. We'll hear from their uh, uh, executive team about what's ahead, as well as get the numbers on the third quarter. Your reaction? What are you expecting? Yeah, nothing scary this week so far, Maria. And that's the funny thing: the, the tech numbers or the tech earnings. Have, I'm kind of expecting Judgment Day, let's say, in the last three quarters, and it hasn't come. I mean, they've just continued to be, I guess, judged in the positive light. So I think the market's counting that in. And I think also, if you look at some of the data that's coming out this week, jobs, GDP, and things like that, those job numbers, the GDP numbers, it's soft enough to where I think they can motivate the Fed to keep on track here, which I still think is a mistake, as I said in September. But the market wants the Fed to keep cutting rates no matter what it seems like the data is. And I think they're going to get another cut, at least maybe one more this year. And that's something that's motivating markets to keep going up, at least on the equity side, while interest rates go up on the open market side. So if you look at the 10-year rate since the Fed cut 50 basis points last month, it's up considerably in far as yield. So that tells you there's a lot going on here and a lot of things that could maybe break or at least get volatile as we go into, say, some of the forthcoming data points in November and December.
Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the 10-year. We've been talking about the 10-year all week. It's now at 4.25 percent, Scott. Great, great, great uh, call to mention this. Up one and a half basis points again right now. And Kathy, rates are moving up uh, ahead of this big week of economic data on deck as well. I mean, we'll get the September jobs report out tomorrow, the JOLTS report tomorrow, the October ADP number and the first read of third quarter GDP on Wednesday. Then on Thursday, you've got the September PCE index. And then, of course, on Friday, the uh, October jobs report for the month out of the Labor Department. Kathy, what are you expecting here? And what is your take on rates having moved up in the face of the Fed saying they're going to cut rates? Yeah, it's really interesting to see what's going on. First of all, the market is definitely pricing in this soft landing scenario. And unless we get any big surprises this week, I think we'll continue with that. And we will see the Fed continue to cut. In terms of the, 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 uh, the markets, we are looking at uh, large cap value, mid cap growth, and trying to really just stay with it. It's, it's uh, very interesting to see what's happening right now. And we are watching all of these numbers and have no expectation for something that is going to take us anywhere differently than where we've been. A lot going on before a big week of elections, too. So have you think the markets are rallying ahead of these numbers, thinking that the soft landing is here? Or do you think this is about big tech or it could be about the final week of the election as well? I think it's a little bit of everything. And what's interesting, too, is there's, there's still this bifurcation in the market where you know, the, the wealthier people are doing okay, but it's the middle class that are really suffering right now with, you know, the cost of uh, inflation, uh, the products that they're buying, the idea that, you know, the longer term rates that you're talking about, the housing market, we're still seeing large, higher rates in mortgages, and we may continue to see that. Everyone was expecting, oh, they're cutting rates. We're going to see the mortgage rates go down. Right. Not so. So this is a very interesting thing to watch. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, Scott, if you're going to see a second spike of inflation. Is yep. that the message of the markets right here? You know, because Jason Trenert has been on this show from Strategist many times, a friend of the program, and he came out with research that says when you have an inflation spike, the kind that we had in the last few years, six, seven, eight, nine percent higher um, overall on the CPI, you typically see a second wave of inflation follow. And with all of the, you know, easy money out there and with rates moving higher, it feels like, well, maybe markets are expecting that. I think the market's predicting that, Maria. And I think that's something, too, if you look at just rates and how the, the, the Fed didn't just kill inflation completely and, and fully, as they said they were going to do. And then they jumped back into the rate cutting cycle pretty quickly when they got the pressure. And so it, it's kind of what said too earlier from Kathy. It's like, what, what is the middle class these days, by the way? Because I get it. The high end is doing better. They're getting even higher when it comes to their spending and some of their profitability. But the low end is getting lower. And so that middle class, if there is even one left over, is getting squeezed out. So you've got that kind of thing going on with the economy going forward here, which regardless of, say, policy or from Trump or Kamala Harris, if there's inflation to boot, uh, to deal with to boot, you're going to have a really interesting economic situation here coming into 2025, especially yeah. with the Fed looking to cut more rates. Yeah, and we've got a market that is showing real gains here year to date, 23 percent on NASDAQ, 22 percent on S&P, 11 percent on the Dow. Without much volatility, too, Maria. Not much yeah. volatility even this year. A couple down days, but that was pretty much it. What a year. Kathy, great to see you. Come great back soon. You. Thank you so much. Kathy Entwistle, Scott, you were with us all morning, and we are grateful. Quick break, and then one Harris campaign. Heartbreaking to see the impact of this wide open border, Liz. I mean, there you have Jocelyn's mother. I mean, she's not the only one. Lake and Riley, others, as a result of this wide open border, unvetted people coming in, committing heinous crimes. Yeah, th I think this is really sort of the essential uh, argument in this campaign, yeah. Maria. I mean, I, I know we're concerned about inflation and the economy and so forth, but I don't think there's a single person in this country who supports throwing open our borders with all the horrible things that have followed, whether it's fentanyl deaths, 100,000 dying from fentanyl that came across the border, hundreds of people on the terror watch list coming across, and yes, the horrible murders and crime and violence that has followed as we've let in all these people. Now we know the actual numbers who have actually been convicted or accused of murder and other horrible deeds. So who is the advocate for this unfettered influx of people coming across our border illegally? It yeah. has re it has wreaked havoc on our blue cities. It has frightened neighborhoods of Hispanics in particular living around those blue cities. There is nothing good to say about this. And I got to tell you, I think Donald Trump doubling down 
down on it uh, is completely appropriate. I think it is the convincing argument of why Kamala Harris indeed should be fired. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, I, I, I'm wondering what's the story on Beyonce? Okay. Yeah. Uh, real controversy at the Kamala Harris rally in Houston. Attendees were outraged after Beyonce comes and she doesn't even perform. She gets at the podium. She speaks about abortion for a few minutes. Several media outlets reported Beyonce was expected to perform. Trump advisor Tim Murtaugh accused the Harris campaign of lying to build a crowd. More than 30,000 people attended the rally. And then what, were they, what did they get? They didn't get Beyonce singing. She didn't sing. Former President Trump spoke about it at his campaign stop in Michigan. Watch this. Beyonce went up, spoke for a couple of minutes, and then left. And the place went crazy. They booed the hell out of everybody. They thought she was going to perform. Now, I would have no interest in that, but they said, and what happened is my opponent got up and started speaking. They booed the hell out of her. Yeah, Liz, I, this is not the first time this happened. Okay? Yeah. There was another rally Twice. a couple of months ago where Kamala says, oh, Beyonce's coming. They, they leaked it out that Beyonce was coming. Beyonce was coming. She never showed up. That was and it. then she, 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 she claims she went to this rally as a mother, not oh. as a singer, as, not as a celebrity. Yeah, so people aren't very excited about Beyonce as a mother. It was at the Democratic National Convention, Maria, the night that That's Kamala right. Harris was supposed to speak. They were so freaked out that yeah, yeah, people yeah. might not stick around for it that they pretended that Beyonce was going to show. So, I mean, this is Lucy in the football. Hello, Democrat supporters. Maybe you don't and get cost what you involved. Pay That's for, right. right. Paying for you. There's Cost involved too, Maria, which also came into play that maybe they didn't want to pay her to stick around and sing. Which, if you're Beyonce, don't you want to take this election? So, therefore, you say, Hey, look, I'll give you maybe a discount. I'll sing an extra song or actually sing a song to get people there that are actually there that'll be happy when they leave. Now, everybody leaves yeah. mad. That's why I'm questioning whether or not Beyonce is actually supporting Kamala. Bingo. Okay. I mean, I don't know. How hard I'm is not it to sure sing? about it. I'm not, I'm not buying it, okay? I mean, <laughs> no. when, Obama was in, when Obama was out, all the stars came out. They were all singing. I doubt they were getting paid. I don't know, by the way. But I don't know that this was the fact that they didn't want to pay her. I don't think Beyonce wanted to sing. Eminem rapped? Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on. And it was terrible, I, obviously, with Obama. But still, they did it. And still, so Beyonce is, shows up, says four minutes of just junk, and then just runs away. Let me bring in Texas Congressman Pat Fallon, member of the House Oversight and Armed Services Committee's Congressman. Um, we're talking about Beyonce here. Your thoughts on uh, another uh, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, uh, I don't know, surprise, Beyonce shows up and then she doesn't even sing. Yeah, it was kind of like dangling the carrot and uh, they got the stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, listen, in Texas, Maria, we, we have early voting data for the first week. And in four years ago, at this time, the Republicans, of the voters you can identify, we had an 85,000 uh, voter advantage. Today, right now, in this cycle, that's 515,000. That is a massive shift, and it's very good news for Republicans, Ted Cruz, and, of course, Donald Trump, and Republicans really across the board in the state. Look, I'm looking right now at Poly Market, um, Congressman, and this is the 2024 election forecast. Donald Trump, 66.6% versus Kamala Harris, 33.4%. I mean, it's incredible what these polls have been showing, uh, particularly the betting, the betting uh, sites in terms of Trump taking this election. Your reaction to where we are here and what you're expecting uh, in eight days, election day in eight days. Honestly, Maria, it's getting better and better, not only the polls, but now when you have actual early voting data of identifiable voters, partisan yeah. voters. And in Nevada, the Republicans have a 30,000 vote lead. And I hear that it's the same in Georgia, North Carolina. I spoke with Speaker Johnson last night. He says it's across all the battleground states. So if this holds over the next week in early voting, I think those numbers are going to be more like 85-15 or 90-10 um, come next Friday. Uh, what, what's your take on, on foreign affairs and foreign policy here? Congressman, you're on armed services, and I keep asking the question, why is it that the U.S. buys Chinese drones from Chinese drone maker DJI? Well, that's just it. Uh, we, there's plenty of other folks that build drones and make drones, manufacture them, and we should probably have a better market domestically. 
because you cannot trust the Chinese communists. Hello? I mean, that, I don't think that's a memo that people should get today. I think that's something we should have seen over so, the last 50 years. I mean, so, so is, I this, the, is, it, is this Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? I mean, why? I mean, this is our number one adversary. Isn't it true that whatever those drones mm -hmm. see, China sees, given the fact that they, they produce them? Yeah. Why, why are we sharing such yeah, important if information? If, I, 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 Again, you ask a very good question because anything that if you're a company in China, you are you have the Chinese Communist Party has oversight over you, and then these drones were doing their work for them. So yeah, I'm I'm all for really limiting, if not uh, totally banning Chinese manufactured drones. And there's going to be some kind of a lag time if the market isn't uh, prepared to if there aren't any alternative options. So we need to work on that. Well, I want to I want to know if this is going to be a um, an issue for voters in eight days, Congressman, because it's not just immigration. It's not just inflation. It's not just the economy. It's also this administration, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and, and their foreign policy. Think about where we are. Two wars underway right now. China on the march. I spoke with Kelly Loeffler, mm -hmm. a former senator from Georgia, uh, yesterday, along with Michael Watley from the RNC, to get their take on this election, when we're going to know who won, how does the early voting uh, look. Here's what they said. Watch. The, when do you believe we will know the winner of this election? I mean, Kelly, you've got some states like Arizona saying, oh, we're not going to know for 13 days. What about Georgia? Georgia, I believe we're going to know the night of. I mean, we, we have a law that requires the early votes, absentee ballots to be counted the day of by 8 p.m. And I'm okay. confident that our turnout levels are going to dictate that we will know. Hopefully, if everyone gets out to vote, President Trump will win on November 5th. We're going to win on November 5th, and we're going to know it before we go to bed, Maria. Congressman, what do you think? You think we're going to know on November 5th? I certainly hope so. If we know on November 5th, that means Donald Trump won. That's for sure. I, it, there's, it, look at the, the path for Kamala is not a good one. Right? President Trump is leading across all the battleground states when you add, average the polls out. And if President Trump wins Pennsylvania, I think you can go, go to bed that night because there's really no universe where he wins Pennsylvania and he doesn't hold North Carolina and win Georgia and win Arizona. Uh, never yeah. mind. I mean, we could be looking at a sweep here uh, of all the battleground states for President Trump. You know, I just looked at an Instagram of uh, Fetterman, Senator Fetterman in Pennsylvania. He says the support in Pennsylvania for President Trump mm -hmm. is, quote, astonishing. That is what Fetterman said. Congressman, we got a spotlight mm -hmm. on it all. We're following it. Thanks very much for weighing in. Pat Fallon joining us this morning in Texas. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, sir. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Eight days away from Election Day. Republicans are in their final push now of the campaign season as they work to flip the Senate and regain control of the House. To win the Senate, the GOP will need to flip two seats. The latest Fox News power rankings puts Republicans in control with 51 seats. An all but certain flip in West Virginia and an edge in Montana could get them over the line. Former GOP Congressman Mike Rogers and Democrat Congresswoman Elise Stefan, uh, Slotnick rather, are vying for Michigan's open Senate seat in a hotly contested race that right now leans Democrat. In the final days of the campaign, however, Rogers plans to focus on non-disclosure agreements Slotkin and her staff signed for the development of a controversial Chinese-owned electric vehicle plant in the state. Joining me now is Michigan Senate candidate Mike Rogers. Mike, great to have you this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, Maria. It's great to be here. Is that, uh, thanks be for having us. is that going to be enough, this EV mandate? Tell me what the stakes are in Michigan right now. Well, the stakes are huge. Uh, the Cook Political Report has us as a toss-up, and I'll tell you, our internal polling has us tied uh, going into this last week. So we think we're in the right uh, kind of that poll position to get this thing done. Uh, and it is a big deal, and the reason is the government mandates telling the, our car companies what kind of cars they need to buy and what kind of cars we're going to have to buy is having a tremendous impact here in Michigan. The rest of the country might get a cold on this issue. We're going to get pneumonia. Forty percent less less labor in uh, building an EV automobile, according to the CEO of Ford, uh, and it is having a huge negative impact. 2,400 layoffs at Stellantis, 1,000 layoffs at General Motors. Ford uh, charged off, Maria, $5 billion. And so these things tend to matter here in Michigan for people who are wondering if they're going to have a job next year or not. So what do you think these Chinese factory non-disclosure agreements say? What do you want to know about this Chinese factory that that uh, your opponent is supporting. 
Well, first of all, a, a public official should not be signing a non-disclosure agreement. That yeah. kind of goes against the grain of transparency for your uh, for your constituents. But the part of this agreement, uh, that that company, it's a Chinese communist connected uh, Chinese party, communist connected company, uh, got over about a billion dollars in cash and prizes from the people of the state of Michigan to build a factory. Think of this, the logic of this, in a place that doesn't want it, uh, on to to force our car companies to buy these products to build a car that they don't want to build and by the way they don't have a customer base they don't want to buy them and so all of none of this makes sense to the average Michigan citizen so why a non-disclosure agreement why did you sign it what's in those deals that you don't want to talk about uh, and it's that's really concerning to a lot of people so you get north of uh, Lansing in, in Michigan this is a hot hot topic and if you get uh, close to the southeast where we actually b build a lot of these cars the auto workers, the Teamsters, this is why they're coming over to our campaign. They understand this is not the right direction for the future of the country. We just skip right past uh, hybrid vehicles, which would mean we could keep automobile, uh, you know, UAW workers. We could keep Teamsters hauling cars. All of these things are starting to play in in this last week of the election. And people are saying, man, we're just not better off than we were four years ago. Our groceries are higher. The border's a mess. Internationally, it's chaos. Yeah. And oh, by the way, they're trying to take our jobs right here at home. Well, I mean, this is why President Trump went to Detroit the other day, and he basically promised an auto revolution, that he's going to ensure that he's using tariffs to stop China from sending in, you know, cheap vehicles. But just to have this factory right there in the heart of, uh, of Michigan, uh, Scott, jump in here. I mean, they're already conducting surveillance programs on America. What is this factory going to do, having this Chinese factory there? Um, More of the same. Thoughts? More of the same, Maria. I mean, more of the same of what China's been doing for the last four years here under the Biden administration. And so that, that's what I'd say, you know, with regards to the voting base in Michigan, I mean, do we really, uh, does the UAW, do the, the auto workers really get it by the time, say, they go to the polls here or go to the, the voting booths? Because that's what I get concerned about. You know, Joe Biden tried to be the friend of the uh, auto workers when they were polling and he, or, or, or protesting rather and striking. And then he jumped on the lines with them and was carrying the sticks and saying, yeah, you need yeah. more. You need more. Let me let me uh, pick it with you. Do they have enough information now to know that they need to vote for Trump versus Kamala Harris right before uh, November uh, coming up here? What do you think, here? Mike? I do. I, you know, here's, there's a reason that these polling numbers, when the Teamsters took a poll internally, it was 60-40 Donald Trump. When the UAW, uh, they didn't really take that same kind of poll. Right. But what we're finding is they're doing rallies at plants uh, by former UAW members, and they're coming back saying, hey, it's, like, it's about 60-40 of these folks leaving the plant and giving thumbs up, taking signs. So I do think something's up. They know that something Something's going on, and it's not good for their future and their economic future. And oh, by the way, add all all the other problems: high gas, high groceries, all of the other things that came with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are saying, "Hey, we have to have a change." That's why I think this is going to change, and that's why we're going to win this election next so month. So, do you? So, you think the GOP takes the Senate, and you're going to be part of that? I do. I really do. I mean, okay. we're, all of the, our independents are starting to break our way. I mean, we've done a massive ground campaign here in the state of Michigan, uh, and you can find out, find out about that at rogersforsenate.com. Love to have you on board in this. This is going to come right down to the wire. It's going to be close, but we're going to win because independents are coming over, and we have all these diverse coalitions starting to come in. You know, Trump ha brought uh, uh, something like 10 or 12 imams uh, yeah. on stage in Oakland that. County, and that is that. a really critical voting block. Yeah, I mean, increasingly you're hearing the Arab community stand with Trump. I mean, that's why v Vice President Kamala Harris is going to make a lot of campaign stops across the state of Michigan today. She'll deliver remarks focused on manufacturing. She's going to tour a semiconductor facility that received millions under the Biden-Harris administration's CHIPS and Science Act. Former President Trump campaigned in the battleground state over the weekend as well. He's promising to revitalize the city of Detroit, as I just mentioned. Here's a bit of that watch. Did you see her interview the other night? She said, essentially, uh, yeah, I'd keep it the way Biden had it. Oh, that's great. That's great. He got out because of the way he kept it. She'll keep it the same way. U.S. car sales are down 38% since I left office. 
But with victory in November, we're going to take back what is ours, and it is ours. We're going to take it back, and we're going to bring back our jobs, our dignity, and our dreams. By the end of my term, the entire world will be talking about the Michigan miracle and the stunning rebirth of Detroit. So, so, Mike, prominent Muslim and Arab leaders in Michigan are backing Trump. They joined him on the stage, as you just mentioned, during the rally in Michigan. Trump also spoke about this, this support from the Arab community at his rally last night when he was at Madison Square Garden, um, which, of course, commanded, what, 20,000 people or so. How does this overall race feel to you right now in terms of the presidential level, Mike? Yeah, I think he's up. Our internal polling has uh, the president is up in Michigan, uh, which is great news. As I said, independents are moving our way. Uh, I, I tell you what, I think there is an under polling issue here in a state like Michigan. I think it's other states as well that you're going to see some surprises on November 5th. You know, is, you know, four years of, or, you know, six months of really negative and false cam, uh, campaign ads can't make up for four years of bad policy. And families here in Michigan are hurting because of that policy. Yeah. And, and we should point out it's not just China. I mean, I know you're worried about this China plant. But, you know, President Trump said it's not just China. He's going to stop cars made cheaply in Mexico, in Europe. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's an overall strategy to make cars in America is what Trump is running on. Not so uh, for Kamala Harris, but we'll see what she says today on manufacturing. Yeah, and, and he's talking about a reciprocal tariff uh, here. So if somebody else is charging us whatever, 25%, yeah. we're going to charge 25%. That's just about fairness here. And I think that's really, really important. That's why we're going to win this race next week. All right. We will be watching. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Mike Rogers, Senate candidate in Michigan. Hey. Quick break and then your morning forecast. Washington Post, meanwhile, becoming the second major publication to not endorse a political candidate this year, saying they won't do so in any future elections. However, the paper did weigh in on some House and Senate races, endorsing only Democrats. And Maria, interesting, former editor Marty Barron saying the paper was spineless. Back to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Liz, your reaction? Well, look, I think the Washington Post owner, Jeff Bezos, sees the writing on the wall. Uh, he does have business interests, certainly, uh, that intersect with the federal government, need the support or at least the uh, to get along with the federal government. So I'm not too surprised that he directed the newsroom not to uh, publish an editorial. As to Michelle Obama, poor, poor Michelle Obama, like her husband, is disappointed in the country half of which, Maria, is supporting Donald Trump. And I'm a little sick of everyone talking about MAGA Republicans like this is some weird offshoot group. Guess what? It could well turn out on November 5th. It is the majority of the country. And the people who pretend not to understand this support for Donald Trump, they should really kind of get out and talk to some normal people about why it's there. Well, I mean, you got, you got to work really hard to make, you know, make America great again. Bad words. Yes. I mean, hello, what's wrong with making America great again and getting back to where we were in terms of the American dream, Scott? It's, it, it's less and less uh, achievable for more and more people. Yes, it sounds good to me, Maria, and I'll tell you what, I mean, it, when, you, when you think about Michelle Obama, she's frustrated probably at her, at her candidate more likely because of the fact that we don't have any idea of what she stands for or what the policies are going to be other than the policies she's stolen from Donald Trump and reiterated as her own. So maybe that's the thing that she's really maybe upset about. But look, if you look at the middle class, we talked about this in the word on Wall Street earlier this hour, the middle class is eviscerated. So you have that middle class that's been crowded out either to the high end or to the low end. And so you need to get those voters back somehow. And to me, without any clear policy, say, uh, rhetoric, you're not going to get it because of the fact that we don't know what she stands for. Well, I mean, you've been warned, okay? You've been warned by Barack and Michelle. Get behind this candidate or else they're frustrated, they're mad, they think that, uh, you know, I mean, they keep trying to make believe it's because black men don't uh, have a comfort feeling when the woman is present. It is so ridiculous. Uh, Jerry, thank you. Welcome back. We are 30 minutes away from the opening bell on Wall Street for a Monday. Let's check markets here. We've got a big rally underway. Dow Industrials right now up 180. Let's get some final thoughts. Scott. So big week, Maria, earnings. Uh, we've got obviously some GDP numbers and jobs numbers. And I think, Maria, 
This determines kind of where the Fed goes from here, not only even maybe just the economic numbers, but also maybe some of the earnings numbers, how the market behaves. And we see what interest rates do in the open market. That's the biggest thing, boys and girls. If yeah. the Fed is on the right track here, as I said, they weren't, by the way, in September. Why are rates going up if the Fed is cutting them down? That's a great question. Seems Absolutely. strange to me. Yep. Liz, final thoughts. Uh, pretty consequential week in terms of the election. We're going to hear closing arguments from Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. I think we know what Donald Trump is going to be talking about. Uh, issues of importance to voters like immigration and inflation and the economy. I have no idea what Kamala Harris's closing argument is going to be about, Maria. Uh, I think she's absolutely foundering. And frankly, I think that's one of the reasons the market has been trending up. I think people see a Trump victory. They see lower taxes, less regulation. You know, with all yeah, the fine. talk about the, uh, of Kamala Harris's economic program, no one ever talks about a $5 trillion tax hike. That's yeah. what she's talking about. And uh, there's a good uh, uh, op-ed in the journal today uh, about it. Uh, everyone should read it because this this will not do our country uh, any good at all. Yeah. And, and Wall Street knows that. The yeah. Wall Street they knows know. that totally. Kamala Harris comes a whole host of new regulations and higher taxes. Hey, let's not forget, tonight is game three oh, that's true. of the World Series, guys. Um, yeah, the Dodgers have been doing real well. Do or die. Yankee, Yankees bounce back. I'm yeah. telling you guys. Do I think they're even the series here. They, they're bound to bounce back. They're too good of a team to just lay down like this. So, uh, Otani's a little bit hurt too, Maria. So that's something to liven up the team and I think get them to take a couple games here while they're back home. Yeah, it makes me think of my first pitch when I threw the pitch Whoa. at Yankee Stadium right before the playoffs and got it right over the plate. What Whoa. can I say, Scott? Well, I don't go. know if you knew that, but you know we're. Right I think that was a, a change-up, maybe, Maria. That was a good Ooh. one. Uh, maybe a slider. I mean, that was pretty solid. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> Thank you for humoring me by watching that pitch again. Thanks, everybody. Great to be with you.